is Roger. Uh, I'm going to show you today <clears throat> how a 12AX7 is constructed and then on this piece of paper I'm going to show you how the elements of the tube fit into the schematic that we talked about before of the single stage amplifier. <clears throat> now before I do that let me give you a couple of eBay tips. This is a bad 12AX7. This is a good 12AX7. What went bad on this 12AX7 is you see the top is all white as opposed to this one being silver. The silver on the top is called the gettering, although some people call it the getter. The getter officially is something on the inside we'll show you in a moment. This 12AX7 died because it developed a crack in the bottom of the base. And this crack, you may not be able to see it, it goes from the bottom up the side. And this is just a simple glass failure uh, due to stresses in the glass. Glass can do this. It <clears throat> doesn't happen very often, but the getter turning white is an indication literally that air got into the tube. Now, if you're looking at tubes on eBay, of course, you're not going to buy that tube. <clears throat> but also notice on eBay, as I have many times, you'll see the tube and you need to know where the silver was in the beginning. And on these small tubes, it's generally at the top. On power tubes, it's often at the top and the side. And if this, as the tube ages and is being used up, this silvering slowly retreats from the edge here toward the top because it's thinnest at the edge and it's thicker near the top. It's also interestingly angled at the same angle of the getter inside, which I'll show you. But as it, as it retreats, it often leaves behind a brownish stain and so you can see where it used to be and where it is. On a small tube like this, if the gettering has eroded at all, I wouldn't fool with that tube because in a small signal tube, if the gathering is eroded, it's very, very much used up and probably gassy at that point and you don't want that tube. I've seen tubes on eBay that have virtually no gathering and I can't believe they're on there. Now what I'm going to do, if you have a, a tube that you don't want, you can break it open and see what's inside and I'm going to do that. Before I break this open though, I want you to know that uh, tube pins often get bent. Actually these got very bent. Uh, and even if they're bent this much, they can be straightened. Now you can't shove this into a pin straightener, but you can take a small pair of pliers and just simply gripping the pin, you can bring it back up again and straighten it, get it from whichever angle you want. Uh, certainly don't bend it past the point, and do keep in mind that sometimes the glass will crack, but that's the risk you take. What else are you going to do with the bent tube? So, when you get the pins fairly straight, if you do have a pin straightener, if you get them straight enough, then you can insert it in the pin straightener and let that do the rest of the work. But if you don't have one, you can just pretty much eyeball it and get them straight and take out the kinks at the same time. Now let's break this one open because it's already lost its vacuum. Pliers work nice, or a pair of vice grips. I'm going to go over the trash can with this, but all we're going to do is going to crush the glass. There's the sound of the crushed glass. And to my knowledge, there's nothing toxic or dangerous in a vacuum tube. Just don't cut yourself. Now we have the naked tube here. And sometimes this little bits of glass at the end we'll get rid of. There we go. All right. Now, we have a twin triode here. There's one plate and there's the other plate. These two are identical sections, or as close as can be humanly possible. This is all assembled by hand, by the way, and we're going to disassemble it by hand, pretty much part by part the way they put it together. This halo at the top is the getter. Uh, there are people out there who talk about halo getters and double halo getters and D getters and so forth. And some people think that an RCA 12AX7 with a D getter is just the most incredible thing in the world. I'm not so sure. Let's cut the getter off, and there he goes. <clears throat> By the way, the getter is kind of interesting in the way that it's a circle, but it has a cup it's in the circle. And in the cup, they put the barium or whatever gettering material there's going to be. And they then, this cannot be flashed, of course, until the tube is completely sealed off. It's sealed off from the top here. There was a long tube of glass here going to the vacuum pump. But once they seal that off and the tube is at a very high vacuum, this gets rid of any little bit of anything that's left. They flash it by putting a induction ring around circling the getter, hitting it with 30 megahertz of energy, and this little baby glows red hot, 
and the barium material flashes out much like an old time flash bar that you've seen when people had a box camera and they held up that bar that flashed with the flash powder. It's a one time deal. It deposits the metal then on the top of the glass and then as the tube ages that metal sacrifices itself, turns into an oxide and keeps the gas uh, level in the tube extremely low, which it needs to be. Now getting back to the fun part of the tube that really does the work, the whole thing's held together with these micas. And this tube has a very interesting feature. This is the Telefunken design. Uh, it was actually made in the Yugoslavian Elektronska Industria EI factory, and I visited that factory many years ago and saw them make these. Um, some people think that a Telefunken tube sounds better than this, but this is actually the Telefunken design. So whether it sounds different or not is up to the listener. But this tube has a very interesting feature in that the cathodes have this little hole down on top. It's a little piece of mica that's actually sprung up and pushing down on the cathode, and this is done to reduce the microphonics of the tube. Tubes become microphonic or are microphonic from the beginning because the elements are loose and can rattle around and they don't have to be very loose to get some pretty bad microphonics. The only thing that holds all these elements in place are these micas. So let's take this apart. And this has two micas because there's one mica that's hold these little hold downs. And not every 12AX7 in the world has these, just the good ones. Let's see if we can get that out. Well, we'll just take the whole thing off and then it'll come apart. So I'm just using my cutters here. I could use a pair of pliers. I'm straightening out these little tabs, these little gray tabs. And I have to cut this off because there's a weld there. All this is spot welded together by ladies with microscopes and very delicate hands. So I'm going to undo this. I'm going to do it somewhat carefully so I don't mess up the innards that I care to show. There we go. I care to show you. Now let's look at the mica. This is actually in two pieces, which, ah, there we go. So this is your typical mica, has holes in it, uh, very precisely made. And the folks in Yugoslavia told me that they spend something between fifty and $100,000 on the tool that stamps that out. Not sure how true that is, but could be. This is another piece of mica. Now this one is clear. This one used to be clear, but it was passivated, which is another uh, operation to make it a better insulator. But this one has the cute little springs. I don't know if you can see them. I'll sort of bend one up. This, they just shaped a little spring, a sort of a leaf spring, out of the mica. And it's hard to show you. Everything's so small here. But this little leaf spring just sits on top of the cathode. And because the cathode sits up a little bit, this just provides a little downward pressure to help keep the cathode steady. Because microphonics are caused by motion between the cathode and the grid. So if you can keep the cathode and grid sort of locked together, then you will have a low microphonic tube. At RAM tubes, we have realized over the years that you can't really make a low microphonic tube, but you can try. And then what we do is we test these tubes and we pick out the ones that are really, really good. And that's what we sell. The ones that are not so really, really good can also be used as driver tubes. The only time you need a really quiet tube is in the front end. And this, this is the one with the cracked base, so I'm having to kind of cut the base away a little bit. The little tubes are a little harder to fuss with than the big ones. But I thought I'd show you the real thing here. So we're going to get the base away here. Um, there we go. Okay. Now, the I cut the rest of this away. Well, I'll hold on to that. The piece between the two micas is called the mount. And it's completely assembled before it goes into the glass. And then all the little bottom bits of it are spot welded to this bottom header and so that you can get the pins out. Now we're going to take off the plate because you got to take off the plate because everything else is underneath. So again, there's some little folded over pieces of the plate. Now the plate's kind of interesting. This is made out of a strap of metal that comes in a long roll that they buy. And there's a little spot weld here we have to get rid of. There we go. I think we
we can get the plate now. There we go. And the plate is really made out of a strap of metal that's been bent and formed and then put together and then swaged over. Some power tubes, you'll see these pieces are actually spot welded together, but we're basically making a box out of a strap of metal. And when this box is made, by the way, this is uh, shiny aluminum. It's actually aluminum over steel. And the aluminum is used because when they put it in a furnace, they can blacken it from heat and introducing some gases. Now the real fun of the tube, where the action is really happening, is with the grid and the cathode. And here is the grid. There's two posts, and here is the cathode in the middle. And we're going to pull this out so you can look at it. But you can see that it's a pretty big box for the grid and the cathode to sit in. These, by the way, there is a good distance here because the the voltage between the grid and the cathode is very low, and the voltage between the grid and the plate is rather high, so we need to have some space for that. Now, if we cut this carefully, I think we're going to take, I'm going to take out the grid and the cathode maybe at the same time. We'll see. There, let's see what we get. Now, the grids I saw at the factory are wound on a machine that looks kind of like a lathe. And on this lathe, if we can get this out of here, there we go, we got the grid. On this lathe, two pieces of wire come out from a rotating mandrel, and this very thin grid wire, which sort of just looks like a haze, as, this, as these two wires turn on a mandrel, this wire is carefully wound, very precisely, the spacing is absolutely equal, and the grid wires are actually nicked as this rotates a knife blade pastes little nicks into the side rod and the grid wire falls into the nick and is held by that. Pretty amazing. And to some extent this is a fairly rigid structure and when they're made at the factory these are dropped into little trays in little individual openings in the tray and they're literally picked up with a pair of pliers by the person who's assembling the tube and they literally take this and stick it into the mica on the bottom after they've stuck in the cathode and then they eventually get the top on and it's all done by hand.